Yo, what's poppin' everybody? Welcome back to the podcast, another episode of Caffeine and Green with your man, Connor Cardenas. And before we get into it today, I just want to give a huge shout out to the title sponsor of Caffeine and Green, which is Seven Seas Roasting Company, coming straight out of San Diego, California, my home roaster, and most of the time where you'll find me during the week. Now, what's so great about Seven Seas Roasting is that we're doing things a little bit different in specialty coffee. We're working with coffee farmers in villages in Laos and Vietnam, and we're bringing those coffees to life. But along with that, we're also showcasing other amazing coffees, Colombia's, uh, Ethiopians, Guatemala's, Mexican coffees, which is coming down the pipe. So get ready, y'all. Now, full transparency, I am the head roaster at Seven Seeds, as most of you know. But regardless, I think by now y'all know that I'm giving you straight fire with that coffee. So what I want you to do is head over to sevenseasroasting.com, put in my code C and G at checkout, and you're going to get a deal, which is Three bags of coffee for 30 bucks. I mean, that's a no brainer if you really think about it because two bags is $32 right there. So you're essentially getting one bag of coffee for free. It's a no brainer, like I said. Now, right now we have the El Jaguar, which is amazing. It's chocolate, it's nutty. It has a little bit of orange zest up front. We also have an array of new Lao coffees. The Katua Village, we have the Fodom Kwan, and we also have the classic set upon now we also have some other things coming down the pipe again like i mentioned so be ready but that's what you have to choose for and we have amazing those they're they're just they're amazing coffees i really hope you guys enjoy it and again use that code c and g at checkout that's c a n d g and you're going to get that deal three for 30 bucks now unfortunately the charity coffees which is the kaha collective and the spikes roast don't come in this deal but you still have so many coffees to choose from. It's all G. So head over, guys. C and G at checkout to get that deal. My guest today, the bi-coastal, the internationally known, Marco Maestoso. If you don't know him, you need to get familiar because, man, it is truly a blessing to have him on the show because he's on the verge of blowing up. He, I mean, he's already blown up. He's had restaurants in Rome. He's had a restaurant in New York City. And now currently where I met him, he has a restaurant here called My Stoso in San Diego, California, more specifically Hillcrest. He's doing Italian cooking a lot different. And because he is just so unique and the way he cooks is so unique and he's just a character, he's a force to be reckoned with, that's why I wanted to have him on the show. I really hope you guys enjoy this because he... He has a crazy story that includes the New York Times, ABC News, having a restaurant in the house. I mean, man, what? Just just listen to it. It's amazing. Without further ado, Marco Maestoso. This is your time to shine, homie. Let's go. All right. And we are live. Welcome to Caffeine and Green, sir. Thank you very much for having me. Marco Mostoso, you are on Caffeine and Green, and we're reporting live right now. Yeah, very excited. Dude, I was just telling you right before the podcast that I think this shit is pretty sick that you're in my house. I mean, I know we've worked together before. Uh, we've drank a lot of espresso. A we've, lot. We've done a, a, a CBD event. We did? Yep. Uh, yeah, man. But now you are in the house, and we're like really chilling. We're chilling on some... Oh. How do I forget? I always cheers Scott. my guest. Welcome cheers. to Caffeine and Green, sir. Salute. Salute. Sa- Salute. Sorry. Salute. <laughs> Ooh. Mm-hmm. You requested scotch. You're the first guest that's ever requested scotch. And uh, I was telling you, I haven't drank anything like this since I was like 18. Or I haven't drank scotch since I was 18. So, damn. Well, yeah, kind of like me. I haven't drank scotch since 3 p.m. of today. Of today. <laughs> At my barber shop. <laughs> At your barber shop? <laughs> yeah. Damn, but do you just roll with scotch? Yeah, they give it directly now. They know me. They're like, here's your scotch. There Damn. you go. Get your hair cut. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, what a G. That's like some straight, yeah. like, mafioso type shit. You yeah, walk in the yeah. barber shop it's and you like fucking. I'm alcoholic guy, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dude. A A. A A. Yeah, right. Dude, okay, so I just want to get right into it. The reason you're on the show today, you own. 
Maestoso restaurant mm-hmm. in San Diego. It's in um, what's the area specifically? The area is Hillcrest. Okay. It's the uh, it's a North County of San. Di- well, not really with North County, but north of San Diego. Yeah, like uh, we're like pretty. I mean, I guess we're like right outside of downtown. Yeah. 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 They call it North Park or Hillcrest. Yep. Yep. Oh my God, I hit the mic. <laughs> um. So, you're a chef. You own that restaurant. What is it you do at Mastoso? Uh, pretty much <laughs> very close to everything. Uh, I handle the daily business. Uh, I have my wife that helps me on the managerial side and on the marketing side that today is so important actually to be present on social media, online presence, website, and all of this stuff. So my wife helps me a lot on that. But I manage all the day-to-day operations, the new projects, the increasing our level of service every day. We're trying to make something new every day. So I'm very, very present as a chef. Uh, a lot of people say it's not really, really super normal that the actual chef and owner is in there so much, always, always there. But for me, it's very important. Like My presence is important for people working and for people coming, customers. Like When they see me, they know we're on point with what we do we're looking after everything always and what kind of food do you make mostly i would uh, for sure it's italian food uh, we're known as an italian restaurant it kind of limits my vision and culinary because i know i have experience in many different cuisines and i love to bring something good that i find from other places other cuisine other techniques i love to incorporate it in what we do but at base at core at heart we're italian cuisine okay. roman mostly Roman. Okay, Roman. that's what. Well, that's one thing I wanted to get into is that mm-hmm. you, you're obviously you just said it. You're from Rome. Mm-hmm. And then when we born were talking, and born and raised. Born and raised. What is that like? It's different. It's very different. Obviously, we're twelve thousand kilometers away. That's like I don't know, eight thousand miles, something shit like that. But it, it's a different world. It's it's very different. I mean, many people when they think about Rome, it's all about monuments, history, old stuff. Uh, for people growing up. It's it's normal. I mean, the the main thing that I kind of complain in general is about economical and political point of view and moment, historical moment, actually, of Italy. It's a little fucked up. Uh, we really don't have any political good standards. It's really, really a mess right now. It's not a bad life. It's, it's I mean, beautiful places, mm-hmm. great food. The produce itself, like the tomatoes that grow in certain parts of Italy are just unbeatable in almost the rest of the world so there's not much to complain but italians always find a very good way to complain (laughs) there's always something to complain but dude i would just i just went there and i actually wanted to bring that up for uh, for a couple different reasons but mainly because of the coffee but before i Mm -hmm. get into that i mean for me when i went there i yes there's the monuments and everything like that but rome in general is so rich with history Mm -hmm. that more than the monuments. I mean, what did it, did that ever affect you when you were growing up there that you were like a part of something bigger, like part of, uh, I guess our existence as a, as a species had a really big part in Rome, uh, over centuries, millennia, multiple millennia. It's like, it's, it's cool actually to look back at that. Once you traveled, once you'd seen the world, you went around the world and you actually look back at where you come from and, what really Rome is, you really see it. Because honestly, like just born, being born there and growing up, you don't really appreciate that much what we're talking about. Because like you go to high school, even if I live four miles from the freaking Colosseum, I might go there once a year, once every two years. So you don't oh, really wow. appreciate it that much, even if you know it's all around you, but you just grew up there. You give it for granted. It's normal. But... Then you go out, you go live in whatever other country, mostly the newest countries like America, it's new country in the world if you want. And then you look back, you're like, wow, I can really feel that missing of very deep traditions where we come from. Because when we talk about Italian tradition, we're looking at 2000 years old tradition. If you look at Chinese tradition, we're looking at 10,000 years old tradition. So that's really important. That's where you might be like, what the fuck? Like, wow, like there's a history behind people there. Oh yeah. Fucking love it, man. I mean, it was a beautiful place, but that's also another reason why I think I was so, uh, so stoked to have you on the show because I created 
the, the blend that we have at the shop now are dollar espresso shots, which is called the Roma. It's specifically for you. That was made because <laughs> of so cool. you, period. And you were like saying how the, the espresso yeah, in America is all shit. You have to say exactly. You Dude, have to say how this was born. Bro, I'm telling you that I met you and you were drinking my espresso and you're like, you Americans, you drink sour fucking espresso. <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? Like, this is all I know. But he's like, basically we would like go back and forth about espresso and you say it's closer, it's closer. And then finally one time you came and you're like, what are you doing right now? I was like, I'm hanging out with you. That's what my job is to do right now. And you were like, let's go. You took me to that Italian spot, mm -hmm. uh, your homie spot. And then we had a shot of espresso and I was like, okay, this is just like a single origin Brazil roasted super dark based off of what I could tell or whatever, uh, whatever other one. And then I finally go to Rome and the first thing I do is like, I find, um, I'd say it's cafe del Taza. I think it's, it's right next to the Pantheon. I don't know. Taza del Oro. That's Adoro. Yes. Yep. That's Adoro. And I had my first espresso in the way that they had the espresso bar there when you just like pay the dude at the other side and you walk up, you give your mm -hmm. ticket and then they give you your shot. And it was like, that's how I, fast, bro. This, we have to talk about this later. Dude, it's fast. It's so fast. And then they, they give you the seven grams and you, and I, as soon as I tasted it, I was like, I get it. I fucking get it. <laughs> and I was like, I can do this. And I was sitting there with my wife and I was just like, boom. Oh, I took another one. I was like, oh, this is nothing, bro. I got this. I was like, I told her the whole rest of the time. And we went there every day. And then we'd always hit all the other spots just like along the way. Like I need an espresso. Boom. Hit it. And once I had that understanding, I was able to bring it back and really let it shine for you. I feel like. Mm -hmm. And then I gave you the first sample and you were like, yes, mm -hmm. I was all. <laughs> Fuck yeah. <laughs> yes. I was so stoked. Yeah, really. Uh, the blend that we have right now, this one here, really makes me happy. Like I even I I fixed the machine kind of lately on on this bean and now how it comes, I love it. Like yeah. beautiful cream, beautiful body. It's balanced in between sweetness, acidity, and bitterness. There's that balance that but is the main thing we're missing in any other I'll say American espresso i'm not Damn. even talking about san diego i was Damn. in new york i had the same problem i was in miami i had the same problem san francisco la uh, portland whatever it's the same problem everywhere it's like drinking a shot of lemon juice you know? <laughs> and, and italians get so pissed like every real italian that just comes in vacation here because they come they have got they're like where the fuck should i drink coffee in this country like the closest thing i can get is actually starbucks which, Shut up, which no way. Nobody even wants Starbucks in Italy. We still, at today, we don't have a Starbucks in Italy. The only thing they just opened this year is Starbucks Reserve. They open it in Milan, but it's kind of a totally different wave of Starbucks. It's a new thing, so they're trying to accept it in Italy. But still today, fuck Starbucks. No way. <laughs> legend. <laughs> You're a legend. Um, the, that's, it's really interesting you say that because uh, the guys next door, uh, is it PR... Uh, I don't know how to say it. It's a piacere mio or something. Piacere mio. Piacere yeah. mio. They come by all the time. They're mm -hmm. like all their waiters rolled through. There's like three or four of those homies. And I once I told them about the Roma, they all started drinking it. And they were like, they come back they with like their the homies and they're all fucking drinking it. A couple, nice. They'll drink a couple of the regular, but they'll always be like the Roma. Mm -hmm. It was like, nice. Boom, son. I, to me, I'm a, like, a, I based, we all based our menu off traditional Italian drinks. That's the way I like my coffee. And to have like Italians coming in and having like an ode to Rome and like where I actually learned uh, from where you're from to like actually roast coffee f that you would uh, that you would fuck with. Mm -hmm. It's like an ode to you and then Rome and then all those Italians and to have all those dudes rolling through. I'm like, mm -mm. that's what's up, son. That's yeah. hell of what's up. But um, I mean, it didn't even want to sound too like cocky or piece of shit, but it's you guys making espresso which is an Italian thing. So, you know, usually American people drink longer coffees, kind of yeah. what we call Americano, in fact. What, what's Americano? Just a couple shots of espresso and add water. That's what the end of filtered coffee almost basically is. Like yeah. Water through coffee. And it's different. Like you can get different flavors because of all the water you're putting in. When you're reducing it in a shot of espresso, you got to be, you got to be right. You got to be balanced. You got to do it in the right way. 
Yeah. I mean, I completely agree. I've, I just spent two days in LA drinking some of the best espresso that I've ever had in my life. And now I'm, I came back and I had like a Marco moment. I was like drinking my espresso this morning. I was like, shit, <laughs> I'm fucking over this. And everybody's like, you're tripping. It's fine. I'm like, nah, nah, <laughs> it's not good. I was like, I know what good tastes like now. And it's like, you see people who've been roasting for like 15 years and then they have these baristas who like are world champions and then they fucking are like pulling these beautiful shots. They smell amazing and they taste even better. And I'm like, I'm garbage right now. This is shit. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? But, um, I mean, for me, that's another thing. I mean, I wanted to ask you about is like your origin story in sense of like, you're a cook, you move to America, you own your own restaurant. Was there, you know, was there a moment or a meal that you ate when you were a kid that you were like, yo, I want to be a chef or like it changed how you were period. Like in terms of like, did you always know you wanted to be a cook? No. No. Uh, totally honestly no <clears throat> to be totally honest um, and I cannot <clears throat> sorry I cannot even make it philosophical like there was not really a meal where I said wow I really love how to do in this there's been many moments as every Italian grew up where your grandfather's cooking your grandmother cooking uh, you cook yourself for yourself because we go at school our parents work in every day at one we had to cook for ourselves was always the same shit, like pasta with tomato and canned tuna. It was always the same shit. Canned tuna? Like, canned tuna and tomato for five years in a row. Seriously Whoa. crazy. Yeah, same shit. But it kind of came to me really, really after. Uh, when I was in college and I really feel, felt bad for my parents that were paying my tuition for me not to do shit because <laughs> I was not really studying. And I was doing biotechnology. I liked some of the bases, the chemical facts behind the bio biological facts behind, but I hated the job. I hated to be on a microscope. Like my buddy, I think it produces naturally cocaine. I don't do cocaine. My mother still thinks that today that I do cocaine, but I do not do cocaine. But my body produces. I'm pretty sure it does produce cocaine. Oh, your body produces. I got the energy of a cocaine addicted 24-7. Like I really can roll all day and not <laughs> feel tired. Lucky about that. But anyways... Um, I kind of lost the point even on that one. <laughs> no, yeah, I was going to say is like what, I mean, you were eating the pasta and oh, you were, exactly. yes. a, every day there wasn't a moment that no, you said. No, there was not really a moment. The, the real moment, it came when I actually started working in a restaurant because of my guilt. I was feeling kind of guilty. I was like, I have to do, I want to help my parents like kind of sustain myself into college. And I went to work at a restaurant. Um, actually, honestly, I did already a couple of seasons before when I was younger in summertime in restaurants. And it w always was a job, nothing really that it seemed like it could become a career. Uh, then I started really working and getting more responsibility in a kitchen in the small town where I, where I was studying. And I realized I really, really liked to do what I was doing, like creating the creative part was really the main thing that as soon as I was able to put some of my own creativity in the food, I realized that I really loved the process. The process, the chemical process that happens in transformation in food, it kind of clicked one day on me and it, w and it was kind of revelation. It, what, I, what my mind thought it was, this is the most important thing human beings are doing in their whole fucking life. I don't matter if you do a 20 billion company with Apple, you still have to eat right to sustain your body, otherwise you'll fucking die. Yeah, uh, you still have to put gasoline in your car. If you put water, you'll fucking crack the car. And I love that. Like how really important that gesture of cooking and cooking for somebody else. And in a way, giving help to other people, it what really motivate me. And what brought me mostly on the direction of fine dining, of high level of cuisine. It was actually the real health wise product. Like the time I spend with my products is very important for you as a final customer because I'm not selling you shit to put it back in coffee. Like the food that I give you, I know it's good for you. You won't feel heavy. You won't feel sick. You're not going to get a cancer in 10 years. It's many, many different things uh, that all come together and they fulfill me. And I always felt fulfilled. I felt happy. And in this stressful, <clears throat> sorry, in the stressful situation of a restaurant, I take out the fun and I'm always the one laughing. And the more you put me in the shit, the more I'll laugh. And the more Sick. I'll laugh at you that you cannot get out, I'll make you suffer even in the moment. <laughs> and then I'll fix it. Last minute, <laughs> I'll be the one who fixes everything. Like, but I love to be in that moment of adrenaline where you're like, shit, we're in the shit. 
Yeah. Like we need to get shit done right away. I, it brings up that, that natural cocaine my buddy produces. So I think I'm in the right word, like world for myself. Dude, fuck yeah. <laughs> I mean, when you, when you're in the kitchen, do you have like music that you're playing that like gets you in the zone or like, are you more of like no music and you're just vibing on the sounds of your surroundings? Uh, good question. I can do both. Uh, I'll say this. I'll separate the moments. Um, the moment in the pure service, like when the restaurant is busy, let's say from seven to nine, honestly, I love to be focused on what I'm doing, like not lose any concentration. So I don't really do music in that period. So I kind of get mad at my guys even there listening music in the back. When we're really busy, busy, I go in the back and like shut the fucking music at least for an hour. But Usually when I'm prepping, when I'm almost, almost getting busy, love to be behind music and feel the rhythm of the music and actually go on with the rhythm of the music. I listen a lot to reggae music from many co different countries, Brazil, Italy, America, love California reggae, Revolution, Soya. All of oh, them. sick. Yeah, love, love them all. But even Italian, shout out to Bundabash, Suzan System, Alborosi, like crazy good artists and... I just roll my day out with them. Like, I need music in my life. That for sure. Fuck yeah. So reggae. Do you, Mostly reggae. Do you, yeah. What else do you fuck with? Like rap? A little bit of rap. Uh, some r and I love the collaboration between Damian Marley and Nas. Actually, yeah, they did a, a really beautiful good album. album, Distant Relatives. That's uh, a really good album. Man, I love the feel. Yeah, I live... I'm, I love everything. There's not something I really don't like in music. In the right moment, I can actually appreciate classical music too. I won't lie, ninety percent fucking boring. But like, <laughs> you have that ten percent of classical music that you can actually appreciate to listen to. Sometimes it depends on the mood. Sick, dude. That's what's up. I back <laughs> that. Um, now, when you're, you know, do you think that the music and we were talking about this before the podcast, like the metaphysical, like, do you think that the energy that you're, you know, either you're creating by the music that you're hearing, or maybe if you're, you're, you're in the shit with your, your staff, your crew, your, your line, and they're tripping out. Are you like vibing, you know, is their energy, are they feeding off of you? Are you putting in the positive or putting out the positive into your food and in the environment that you're in? I do believe in that. Uh, it's kind of hard for me to say if somebody's feeding on my energy, I, I believe I see it. I believe what I really know is that I keep the whole thing glued together. That's my job. That's my main responsibility as a chef in the restaurant. More than being the best recipe holder of the world, I'm more as what people like to say, a leader. Like, But not as a leader as like I'm screaming to you to make everybody work. I'm like, I'll be there for you. If you have a problem, I'll solve it. If we're really in the shit, I got you. I got your back. And I want the people to feed from my energy. That's mostly even why I smile is to make them understand nothing is going to shit, really. We're not saving the fucking world. There's no bomb clocking. There's, yeah. we're just cooking food. Don't worry. They're complaining. Fuck them. <laughs> Whenever it's my restaurant, I'll go to them and say, listen, there's a beautiful shitty pizza I blocked down. Just get the fuck out. And yeah. Like, it's, we're not solving problems in the world. Well, we kind of, maybe we are, but it's, everything is solvable. Everything is approachable. You just have to vibe it out. And yeah, I love to bring my vibe to other people. I hope they get it. I, I kind of see it. So I, I'll say yes. I think Sick. so. Sick. Do you now, you're, you're setting the tone. You're doing these things in your restaurant. For me, I had a mentor in coffee and I didn't realize he was my mentor. I just thought he was like the guy I learned from. But then I look back now, he's completely how I learned the basis of what I did. And so I would consider him my mentor. Uh, did you have a mentor in your cooking? Same thing, man. I really never thought I had a mentor because I worked with many different chefs, many. And from everybody, I'm grateful today for what I stole from them. They didn't give it to me. This is what I hate about a, uh, about a, a many big variety of people that they come to work for you and they pretend that you give to them. It's you taking from them. It's you taking from me. And I want you to take from me, just don't bust my balls in general, but I want you to, to take from me. And that was uh, what I'd done growing up in my career. Just, I tried to work with many different people, uh, many different chefs. And, but at the end, I realized that I actually had a mentor, that it was the person who actually taught me a very simple concept that until I really didn't understand, it didn't click inside of me. But the day it clicked, I felt like I could do anything in the restaurant business. 
it was two simple world, words, and I have to say it in Italian first because I have to think about the translation and didn't prepare this, but the two words are prendi e fai, which it translates in get it and do it. When you understand what get it and do it really means, because you don't until you do. When you do understand, that fucking click changes your life. For me, it didn't in the culinary world, but I believe this can apply to any fucking job, any position, any thing in life, any obstacle in life you have to do. Just get it, understand what the fuck is happening, and do it, and solve it, and go, do something. Like, a little, little, little example. When you're in the shit, many, many people freeze. Like, you have so many things to do, you actually freeze. I've seen so many cooks freezing. At the opening of my restaurant in Rome, a very funny one, it was actually the first day we were so busy, so in the shit. Uh, let's say my sous chef started walking up and down in the kitchen with no sense. And this gone on for like two minutes, and two minutes in the shit lasts forever. And I see this guy just walking up and down, up and down, up and down. Certain point, he has long hair. I grab him from the hair. I'm like the fuck you're doing, just cook a pasta and get it from there. <laughs> it's like, man, man, we have to do 100 pasta. Cook one, let's get it from there and get the fuck on. Slowly we came out of it. It was not, <laughs> it was not the smoothest landing <laughs> in the world, but we did come out of it. Like in life in general, you have no solution to fucking doing shit. You have to solve your problems, do it. There's nothing as bad as can happen to you. Like death is the worst and you'll fucking die, you shut up. <laughs> <laughs> To solve your problem. It's so simple, bro. Yeah. At the end of the world, at <laughs> yeah. the end it is. Like, I feel down. I feel depressed too sometimes. But then I slap myself in the face. I'm like, just get up and fucking solve it. I, it doesn't solve alone. Or, or if it really does solve alone, let the time go. That things get fixed. But can't suicide. You can't. That I really yeah. don't. I really don't love suicide. Like it's something I grew up against. I'm still against. I'm so sad when I see like Robin Williams suicide. Yeah. I hate it. Like yeah. I didn't want that for him. You can be depressed as you want. I understand how many problems you can have and everything. Or the singer from Lincoln Park. It fucking destroyed yeah, me. Yeah, dude, that like, was crazy. Everybody knew there was something going on by the songs you're making. We know, but fucking get up. Fix your life. You have kids. You have 10 million people waiting on your next song that love you to death, that will die for you for in a fucking concert of Lincoln Park. You can't suicide. Yeah, it's very personal. It's yeah, I got gotcha. you. Heavy judgment, but I really don't like it in a way. No, nah, dude, I get it. I mean, yeah, fuck, it sucks regardless. I mean, <laughs> damn. But uh, either way, we can <laughs> yeah, move on from there. Yeah, yeah, that's a heavy one. <laughs> that's too much. <laughs> um, fuck, I forgot what, we were, what the actual question <laughs> of, of was. I was asking you right there. Um, can I can I spark this? Of course. Fuck yeah. All right, sorry. Um, well, dude. You, I, you mentioned something in that story you were just talking about is that you were saying that uh, you and you're opening your restaurant in Rome. So you had a mentor. You did your thing. My stove says obviously not your first, not your first restaurant. Tell me about your, re like, no. how did you become <clears throat> like open a restaurant in Rome? Uh, so uh, I actually opened the first in New York. Uh, wait, what? Yeah. My first place it was in new york was not really in rome okay so wait uh, you basically started learning to cook in rome and then mm -hmm. you went to new york yeah uh my mother is originally from fort lee fort lee new jersey very close to new york just the other oh, side your mom's of an the american bridge. she's american i have american passport i'm lucky oh that's why it's so shit, easy for me son. to have a, have a restaurant yeah that's not easy it's not easy at all but like well it's a little bit easier for me to have documents <laughs> dude that's crazy yeah it's kind of crazy and she was thank god my parents were smart enough that when they went back <coughs> to italy and we were born they were already in italy but 20 years before but they decided to give myself and my sister directly american passport they said you never know what in the future they might do with it if they want to live in italy fuck it live in italy <coughs> you want to go to america you're free to go to america and that for me worked out great not for my sister is your sister still in Italy? My sister's still in Italy. Damn. I'm trying to bring her here, but yeah, I'll have to fight with my parents <laughs> okay. and not show this podcast. <laughs> not show this podcast? <laughs> no, I'm uh, oh, sorry, bro. Um, so what made you want to open up your own restaurant in New York City of all places? So the what really brought me in what really brought me into starting my own brand more than restaurant, um, it was the fact I 
I uh, dedicated my experience life in work and training to see many different things in the restaurant world. I didn't work in a restaurant for 10 years. I didn't stay in a place more than one year. Uh, or I had a situation in Milan where I was working for a banketing that we were doing like 40 different things. So I stayed there almost three years, but I was seeing different things. And this was my goal at the beginning. Like the mainstream, especially in Italy, is stick to one job and don't leave it. Not even if you're talking, keep talking. Keep talking. Not e no, don't leave it. Not even if you find so much better of a job, just everybody sticks to a job and they keep it forever. It's that old kind of traditional Italian mentality. Uh, for me, since the beginning, it was, I just want to see every kind of restoration type there is. I want to see all the different uh, variations of restoration there is. And at the beginning, it was just because, what if I don't really like to work as a chef in a fine dining restaurant? Mm -hmm. What if I like catering? What if private chef is better? What if the cruises i make more money so fuck them all i go to the cruises so i wanted to see a little bit of everything what it that brought me to one day it was to understand that i had to focus my time on investing on more on myself i was already but investing more on myself it for me it meant to go to a brand and be loyal to a brand which i decided to give it my name um i swear to god i didn't do it for ego shit uh, I gave my brand my name, my last name, just because I really love my last name. Uh, my last name in Italian, uh, it's Maestoso, and in English it means majestic. Uh, majestic? Majestic. That's, so That's so gangster. <laughs> so it, yeah, it kind of has like our own good meaning on, it, on itself. And plus, you have a brand that will always rely on a chef. And I just thought it would work. And so from working in a very high-end, maybe the best, the second best hotel in New York, at the Pierre Hotel, I was working in New York, and but I, I really realized that I wanted to go for my own brand. So in my day off, my only day off, I started doing pop-up dinners in New York. A chef and oh. his wife doing pop-up dinners at home on a Sunday. First three Sundays, super full booked. We said, wow, this shit is working. Let me get another day off at work and see if it, it's actually working. I get another day off. We do it two times a week. Booming. Like we get a lot of requests and they wanted us to do more. So after three months, me and my wife actually crazily decided let's both leave our jobs and go into doing pop-ups every single fucking day of the week. We probably make more money. We're working from home. Let's try it. Let's give it a chance. We had a cute studio in the Upper East Side of Manhattan, 72nd and 2nd. And we had a little garden, which I started working on it for a week. I started painting everything, and I made it look like a restaurant. I bought four IKEA shitty tables, put uh, traditional trattoria tablecloths, like white and red big square spots, put them on, and just start doing 20 people per day. And it exploded. In two what months... The fuck? Yeah. In two months, we had ABC News, the TV... Nightline coming in, our our pop-up restaurant, and doing an article on us, like the first chef in the world that actually leaves his job for doing only pop-ups in his home. And it, come, it, it became really big. We even got an actual review from the New York Times. You can actually still Google that Are shit. you serious? Yeah, the New York Times came in and gave us a review. They're like, food is fucking good. It's cheap. It's a very cool experience because everybody does. It, it was everybody was a stranger. You could book only one seat, and the twenty people nobody knew each other. They all got to know themselves at the table, and it was more of an experience, even more than the food. Like the food was awesome, okay, but it was the experience that made the situation, and people loved it so much to go in on like a blind dinner with normal other people, and got to know other people that it exploded. It exploded so much that we had to get a bigger location. And so from there, we actually started Maestro's Restaurant in New York. Holy shit. Dude, did you have to get like permits and shit for your house for like food and stuff? Or is like you just make the food and people just show up? The real beginning, we were laying on other companies. There's companies called Eat Wit, Cook Up, um, eat feastly that you sign contracts with them they come to check your kitchen and they see that your health kind of good like your health uh, knowledge is good you need to have a health department card 
Like yeah. if you work in a restaurant and that's all you needed, then they have insurance and if something happened, they would have been fucked, not me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So it's like a, an insurance, like they're a food insurance company mm-hmm. almost. That's Let's tight. say if we bring it forward to today, to today, it's like if you do an event, a mm-hmm. culinary event every single day. Okay. So that's what you mean by pop up. So did you now when you were doing this, did you have reservations or was it first come first serve? It was re- all reserved online. We had uh, platforms online on their websites, the Eat With, Eat Feastly. We were on four or five different websites and everybody could book the same dinner. So we were always super full. Dude, that's fucking crazy. It was crazy. So you would eat and sleep in your, like you'd sleep in your bedroom, but then your kitchen and your house or like the apartment became the restaurant. Became a restaurant every day. And every day I close it down, clean the whole shit, open the bed and go to sleep. And that that happened for like a year and a half and it exploded. And we actually got to a point where me and my wife were like, we're fucking bored about this. We're limit out. Like, first of all, we're making good money, but we can't make any more money because this is the max. We're maxed out. Then we're living in our apartment a little too much. We're becoming like too much in the apartment. It was a way too much. We said we have to get bigger. And New York is a... It's beautiful city, it's very competitive, there's a lot of business going on, but I didn't see a future of a family, uh, growing a family, having kids. Uh, I didn't love New York, at least for the standards I grew up with. New York for me seems a little bit like a cage. Uh, This is why at the end we chosen to go back and open our first real big restaurant in Rome. Oh, okay, so you're in New York and then you're done with this and then you go to Rome. And you open up something that was just like a legit restaurant? A legit restaurant that was called Casa Maestoso. Because we were recalling the pop-ups that we used to have in our house. Okay. We called it Casa Maestoso. So it's like we're continuing the pop-up dinner series in our house, but in a real restaurant. Sick. And it, it was going very well. Like, crazy well. Yeah? Uh, like, I still have pictures on my Facebook. We were number one on TripAdvisor out of 10,000 restaurants for more than a year and a half. After like six months of opening the restaurant, we started getting closer to the top 50. We made all our way up to number one on TripAdvisor in 10,000 restaurants in Rome. And from there, it just went, exploded. What the hell? 10,000 restaurants in Rome? Yeah. And you were number one? Number one. (laughs) Number one was crazy. I actually hated it. I swear to God. I sent (laughs) one one day. There's actually, I have email proof of this because people don't believe it. I sent an email at TripAdvisor saying, please get me the fuck out of number one in Rome. I don't want to be it. Because I'm only getting, right now, I was getting full of like, I don't know, I, I don't want to sound racist on this, but a lot of like Chinese customers that used to come because they thought they were going to the best restaurant in Rome. So their expectation was like a three Michelin star restaurant where they have like two hostesses hosting you yeah. and they get your jacket and you have a beautiful, super cool fine dining dinner. We still were in that, like that, like... We saved up a hundred grand in New York, went back to Rome and opened the restaurant. Like we're still chill. We're still mom and pop's restaurant. So it it went to a point where people were expecting a little too much from us. And I was getting pissed at yeah. that people because they were complaining about bullshit. Like, oh, the restaurant is not that pretty or they don't have a beautiful decor or the fork is not a fucking $15 fork. <laughs> Shit like that, that I was booming out of my mind. Like I'm giving you good food. Like fuck the fork. Yeah. But yeah. Dude. Okay. So you're, how long did that last? I mean, now you're, you're obviously here in San Diego. You have my stoso here. <clears throat> so two years and eight months after, I think I touched one of the worst moments in my life. This uh, is in Rome. This is in Rome. After two years and six to eight months that we have the restaurant, I felt like I really was in depression, personal depression. I was not happy about where I was living. Uh, I was not happy about the mood of the people I I had around me. Like, this is the main thing I complain about Italy today. The people itself are fucked up. They're mentally laying on, waiting on my parents to die so that I can get the house and continue my life and survive. There's no job, so fuck it, I'll stay home and not work. Um, I'm 35 years old and I still do the shit I was doing when I was 16 years old. Every time I go on vacation there, for me, it's like going back to high school. 
Like I still see my my best friends and they're doing shit and living there, doing the same thing on the same road with the same shops. It doesn't, there's no evolution. It doesn't change. Everybody's still complaining. Political system doesn't work. The, the, the small things like they don't pick up the trash from the streets. There's always holes in the streets. All little things that make the people angry. And the people that you have around you, I really believe they're really important for your own growth. Like, oh, yeah. if you have only negative people around you, you kind of fall into that. Like, I feel, I really consider myself strong mentally and, f and physically and mentally. But when you're really surrounded by so much negativity, you go down, man. Like, oh, I bro, felt yeah. I was really down. I was really depressed. I was not willing to go to work. I didn't feel like... I was complete in my life. Like I was spending all of the money that we did from the restaurant. I had to pay a super fucking high rent. And then I was not living my life. Like all day in the restaurant, people go in Rome. They start dining at nine. Like San Diego, they start at five. Yeah. It's like surfer city. You know, you got restaurants full at five o'clock in Italy. We don't even open at five. We open at seven. Cause from five to seven people fucking drinking espresso still yeah <laughs> like yeah they're, they're cruising like, bro nine is the moment when people go to dinner in italy so wasting all my days until two three in the morning and i got super depressed to a point where i told my wife i'm like i know this sounds crazy but i'm gonna buy a ticket i'm going to america it was the 17th of december i said i found a ticket for 17th of february no 14th of february super cheap ticket for america i said this is it I'm out. I'm leaving the whole fucking restaurant. I'm leaving my whole life and I'm flying back to America. And it was kind of crazy because in that moment it was like, wow, you're leaving. Your family is all here. Your friends, you open the restaurant, you have everything going. It looks like it's, everything is going great. Like everything, social media, everything, everybody thinks we're doing great. Everybody thinks I'm happy. Everything. I was like, no, fuck all this shit. Like, I I feel like I'm gonna be so depressed that I lose it. So I have to get out. I have to get the fuck out. And the 14th of February, I got a plane for uh, San Francisco. Actually, went to San Francisco. Oh shit! Straight yeah. from Italy to San Francisco. From Rome to San Francisco. I thought I was losing it. And in those two months, I found a friend of mine, chef, that got my restaurant in Rome, and he's still in there. He's paying the rent of the restaurant, paying me a. Uh, me and my family she, he's paying uh, rent. Like a rent like yeah. let's say a fee for the restaurant and that's it I left it I just flew into San Francisco there was a Roman guy that was starting the pizza business which is why I'm actually in California and I, o I helped him open his first pizza shop in San Francisco I was managing the restaurant he had in Mint Plaza in San Francisco and I started from there so let's see what's up in California Damn, kinda son, crazy, you know. what the fuck? You are know, so kinda, crazy. Yeah. Just one major metropolitan or like international city to another. Mm -hmm. And then you obviously already spoke English. So yeah. where? Not like, that good, though. Well, it got better. I, and I don't want to lose my accent, by the way. Okay. If I talk too good in English, tell me something because fuck, I have to, I have to get girls. <laughs> my <laughs> wife won't like this, but still, it works with girls. The Italian <laughs> accent. <laughs> <laughs> I dude, I don't have an accent, so I wouldn't <laughs> even know. But, uh, fuck, man. So, what was San Francisco like? I mean, I'm from the Bay Area. I'm from the East Bay, nickel dime all day. All the homies know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you listen to the podcast, you definitely hear me say that. But um, you know, I'll be honest. I didn't like San Francisco. Oh, uh, dude, San Francisco is like, it's kind of you. You definitely have to be from there, I think, to like. I mean, a lot of people like it, but why didn't you like what, it? What what? I know my mother had her her best friend. She's a professor in the University of San Francisco. Uh, she Anne Fontanelle, what, one of the main uh, teachers of San San Francisco University. And what she told me too is like the city is fucked up. Like in the last forty years, the thing evolved deeply. Like it's all actually in the last fifteen years, the San Francisco changed drastically. Oh it's yeah, all another city. Like it's nothing to do. And I'm just uh, nobody that comes in San Francisco in 2017. What I personally see is the most expensive city in America. And I lived four years in New York. So this is the most expensive city in America. The city is not giving me much in return. There's no good subway system. There's no tram system. There's the BART, but it fucking sucks. <laughs> it, it, 
the city is dirty. It's more dirty than New York is dirty, but in a way, New York is a thing. The dirty of New York, people kind of like it. Yeah, like the smells around the blocks. Well, you have like cobblestone that. streets still in like the Chelsea exactly. district. Yeah. It's yeah. like it's been there since yeah. like the 1700s. Oh, some shit. Yeah, exactly. exactly. San Francisco has the beautiful beauty for like if you go on vacation three days, it's beautiful. Yes. To live in San Francisco right now, I think it's oh, crazy. Dude, it's, it's crazy. Insane, you have dude. to be stupid. Like I'm honest. Like I think you have to be stupid to live in San Francisco. If you're not in tech, ma- making three hundred thousand up, because yep. that's a minimum. Three hundred up, okay, I'll accept it. But if you're not, you have to be stupid. Yeah. First of all, the hills. They're cool on a movie. They're cool in vacation. If you <laughs> live on a hill, man. The third day I was living on a hill in Pacific Heights in San Francisco. I was throwing so many bad words to God. He he, <laughs> he might have just came down and slapped the shit out of me because every single day coming back to work, I was like, how can a fucking idiot buy a $4 million house on a fucking steep hill like this? I cannot even walk home. So steep it is. I had a small scooter, 50, electric 50cc. It wouldn't make the hills of San Francisco. Oh, I'm not I believe kidding. it. I, I believe it. Yeah, like, dude. wow, this is too much. This is I, I cannot live here. There's no way. <laughs> and after seven months in San Francisco, <clears throat> where almost every day I was like, fuck this shit, fuck this shit. Yeah. Finally, I go away and I go a little bit south and I go in Los Angeles. was living in Mar Vista between Santa Monica and Venice. And I stayed there six months. And what we were doing there is actually cool. We were doing pop-ups, just like we were doing in New York. The same company that hosted me in New York had a location in Los Angeles on Abu Kini in Venice. Beautiful location. I think one of the busiest areas of Los Angeles right now, Abu Kini Road in Venice. And we were doing pop-ups there. They were going great. But again, living in LA, I felt like it was wrong. Like everything you do in LA, you need to get your car an hour and a half. And you lose an hour and a half plus to go back another hour and a half. So Dude, it's two yeah. hours of your yeah. day you're fucking driving. Like, what the fuck? Like, Los Angeles is beautiful if you live in Santa Monica and Venice and Mar Vista and you don't move and you stay the fuck there. You throw away your car, buy a bicycle, buy an electric scooter, and you live there. Yeah, cool. That's not Los Angeles, though. You can't get 50 fucking cities, put them together, and call them Los Angeles. Come on, that doesn't work. Yeah. Like, that's not LA. It takes me two hours to get LA downtown from Venice Beach. That's not LA. Dude, I just drove. I just drove from downtown LA to the Valley this past uh, this past weekend. It took me an hour <laughs> one way and then forty five minutes the next. I was like, dude, it's not even that far. It's like twelve miles. It's crazy. It's like almost the same thing. Them going from here. Let's say, let's go to LA tonight. It might take us an hour and a half to get to LA. To oh, it took us on. an hour and a half to get to LA, and then probably just to get over into the Valley, another hour and a half. So it's like it's a three hour <laughs> ride. Like, damn, son. Nah. You know, so. But okay, so you six months in LA mm-hmm. and then you go to San Diego. What what brought you here? What brought me here? So a friend of mine from Rome who has a chain of Italian pizzerias here in town. It's called Napizza. They have four locations all around. I know Napizza. What? There you go. Your homie owns that? Yeah. Uh, they used to have five locations, one of the which is closed because now it's called Maestoso. And Shut the yeah. fuck up. Dude, <laughs> yeah. really? That's what wow. kind of happened. So my homie had these pizzerias, and he had one in Hillcrest that it was going like shit, like super bad. Mostly because, uh, and to explain, like we got to point this out, like Hillcrest is a very, very gay area. Like I love gay people, but... Uh, every gay neighborhood in the city, it, you have to take it on its own. Like it's pretty particular, and you have to have the same feel of the neighborhood. And it's it's kind of different. You have to understand your your demographic. You to, yeah, you have to understand your demographic. You have to go with it. Uh, like if you're in Little Italy, you get a lot of tourists. In Gaslamp, you get a lot of tourists. You don't open up Michelin star restaurant in Gaslamp. It's useless. There's all tourists. Uh, in Hillcrest, it's mostly it's a close neighborhood. It's uh, it's really really neighborhoody in 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 a way like it's separated from the mess of the city, and it was not really working on a pizza concept. It was all Italians working there. They were not really working well with the area. The restaurant itself it was too big for what they were doing. They were just selling pizza by the slice, and my restaurant what it is today is very big. It's a, 
2,000 square feet only kitchen plus the external part. So it's pretty big. And to sell only pizza by the slice, it was pretty harsh for them. So he called me. He's like, man, can you help me out on this location? Because it's going a little bit like shit. We're not making money here. I, I know you do a lot of stuff in restaurant business. Can you help me? I was in Los Angeles. I sure. I love San Diego. I've been there on vacation. I've been here in 2005 and 2008 for one month and then three months Damn. in 2008. I always went away. For mainly two reasons, because I said I'm not ready for San Diego because I didn't do enough experience in the work work side of my life. Like I didn't work enough to just stay here. It always felt like I'm a retire in San Diego. It's fucking beautiful. Like people are chill. I saw serenity in people. That was the main thing that made me cry the first time I went away from San Diego. I cried because I really saw the difference in the people. Like everybody here, it looks like basically is fucking happy. Like serene at least they're serene they're chilling they're living the life don't break my balls we're living the sea is here we have mission bay we have the bay area our south bay area. yeah <laughs> like we're chilling down here so don't break your balls and i love that like it made me feel at peace with myself but i was not ready to be here so i always went away like there was no restaurant business in 2005 there was shit food in san diego Italians that came here were like, where the fuck we go to eat? Like, Danny's is our best option. Right <laughs> <laughs> and so I went away. And, but when I came back, and it was 2017, I said, wow, like, things are really growing down here. Like, Little Italy's growing. Uh, the gas lamp, something is growing. It's still kind of up and downs. But it at least the restaurant scene is popping up. People caring more about food, more than just putting food in their self. And I realized that that actually that na pizza was not savable. Uh, that location was going so bad that it, I called him back. I'm like, Chris, close the fucking thing. Like, it's not going to work. Like, I cannot fix it. Uh, there's nothing to fix. It's fucked up. It won't work. You won't make more money than what you're doing. Just close it. He calls me two days after. He's like, man, that we don't want to close it. We put so much money into building that place. We got it from scratch. And we built the restaurant. We put the hoods and everything. We don't want to close it. I said, man, well, fuck you. <laughs> well, you're going to lose a lot of money. What do you want from me? He's like, what if we open a restaurant? Like, you had a restaurant in Rome. You had a restaurant in New York. You can open a restaurant in San Diego. I said, well, it's not really the main reason why I was here, but because I really came to spread pizza. We'll talk about that maybe later. But I really didn't want to do it at the beginning. But after only, like, three days of thinking about it, I'm like, you know what? This is the good trained to actually show my name to people in San Diego, show who I am. People will start realizing that we're here, we're starting something. If we need a restaurant to show our name, fucking let's open a fucking restaurant, whatever. And Dude. that's how actually my still started. And only one week after we signed the contract between each other with the pizza guys. And only two months after I I closed the pizza. I start working with uh, my construction guys for two months, we destroyed the whole place, rebuilt it up, <clears throat> and opened my stores in two months. What the fuck? Yeah, it was and cool. Dalila was already here the whole time? Yeah, she followed me the whole time. She's S she's as crazy as me. Dude, yeah. yeah. That just straight simple. Like, That's sick. The day, actually, the day in Rome when I said, listen, I'm on the verge of depression. I feel bad. I have to get the fuck out. She was like, I'm on it. Let's get the fuck out. <laughs> Sick. Yeah. That's yeah. a ride or die right there, yeah. G. On that's that, I got, I got lucky on that. Yeah. Dude, that's G. <clears throat> so you're doing my Stoso two months in. And how long has the restaurant been open now? What is it? It's fucking September. It's about to be, yeah, 2019. March, one year and five months. One year <clears throat> and five months. Mm -hmm. Now, do you think, I mean, with most... My Stoso just being what it is. Every mm -hmm. time I've gone in there, more and more people are in there. Every time I go in there, you always show me something new. <laughs> it's something sick. You're like, look at this. Uh, this uh, you gave me like a red wine, but it was a white wine. What was it? What was <laughs> yeah. the fuck was it? It's was called it? Greco. Greco, yeah. yeah. It's what a was super it? good wine. Like nobody has. We only have it in the restaurant. It's a That's white crazy. Merlot or something. What was it? Oh, the one in the restaurant, the white Merlot. Yeah, we're the only one in San Diego to have that too. It's actually, it's actually a white Merlot. Merlot is supposed to be a red wine. But this crazy producer, small in the Upper East Side of Italy, Udine, all the way up on the east, 
he creates this white Merlot with no skin contact, stainless steel. So the wine comes fucking white, but like white like water. And I sell it like rivers of that. I sell rivers of that wine. And simply because I can bring an experience to the customer. Because when I bring you that wine, you know what I tell you? What I ask you to any customer, ask you, do you know why we call white wine white wine? Nobody ever had a fucking answer. Wikipedia, if you go right now, doesn't have a fucking answer to this question. The real answer is very simple. We have to go look into the trade market. It's simple. Is white wine is called white wine just because it sells better. Because from Latin world word, I always say world instead of word word cacophonia, which it literally means it sounds like shit. Yellow in every language sounds like shit. Yellow, amarillo in Spanish, giallo in Italian, and many other in French too. It just sounds like shit. White sells better, and they had to sell white wine they had problems selling wine in the rest of the world as soon as trades started working and they actually realized that if they said white wine instead of yellow wine it sold and sold better and that's why we call fucking white wine white wine really yeah <laughs> i got a lot of creative answers people say oh maybe the grapes are white no the grapes are not fucking white the grapes are they're green. like green yeah <laughs> there's no white into the game here there's no white it's just a mistake man Dude, it should be called yellow white that's yeah. crazy and now is that because it was like french and italian is where the, like the wine came from essentially right like those are areas the basic yeah basically it started in 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 italy mostly then it expanded in france in France, the French people just fucking put rules on everything Italians were doing. That's the main, that's why <laughs> Italians, I hate French people. I, I love everybody, but fuck French people. Dude, like, you're I so swear funny. to God, like, yeah, I'm the la last of the races, I'm the last of the thing, but I'll say this fuck French people. The French people just rely on Italians to do shit, they put rules on it. And that's it. They I have no skin it. in this fight, bro. I, I don't know. I have nothing to say about French people. I lived in no, France. They're I, cool. Okay. I lived in Aix-en-Provence. Yeah. That's I lived. Yeah. It was actually, yeah. They're that's our actually, cousins. Dude, that's one thing I actually wanted to ask you about is like, when I went to Rome and then I went to Florence and then we went to Chianti, like Tuscany, mm -hmm. to uh, actually go to Dario Sacchini's restaurant. Yes. And, or I guess, yeah, butchery, if you will. Yes. And... Uh, I fucking do to see the, the wine fields. I wine is a really big part of Italian culture. Yes. I've noticed Rome, regardless, Flo like dude, Florence, holy shit. There was so much wine there. Yeah. It was cheaper to get two red wines yes. than one water. It's like a, a it Euro difference. Like bro. Yeah. So one thing I wanted to ask you is like, you know, with the great selection of wine that you have at your restaurant, the white Merlot that we're talking about, mm -hmm. was wine a really big part of your life growing up in Italy. It is. It is. Yes. Like, you know how here you have a restriction, you can't drink before you're 21? Mm -hmm. And it is it's very simple. It's opposite. You can't drink until you before you're 12. Like, <laughs> when you're 12, and I'm, it's just a joke to say you can drink ever. Like, you start drinking most probably when you're 8, 10, 12. You already had your first glass of wine, and wine is always on the table. It's really something present in Italian life. And... The, the international commerce actually made it better because the fact that we're selling to other countries in the world, like to America, to China, uh, to the West world, to the Euro um, East world, it made wine better because companies had to refine anything they were doing into wine and spend more money into studying, into developing what the fuck we're doing. Because the good thing about us that makes the difference between Napa Valley, between Valle de Guadalupe down here, it, and Italy and France is that we really have traditional traditions that go back thousands of years. I have a wine in my restaurant that is from the oldest winery in the world, which is my new favorite white wine, by the way. And the winery was open in year 1065, so 1065. And they're the oldest, oldest winery in the world because they're still open. Because there's been oldest winery than that obviously but the one that is still open and is the oldest is this guys and this just tells you how many years of actually experience and people just talking to other people for the next generation and teaching you how to treat that plant in that territory that's very important this is why i say 
Napa Valley, the wines can be okay. They'll be never crazy good. It will take them another 100 years, 50 to 100 years to really nail it down. Valle de Guadalupe, another 150 years, knowing how it, it's working down there. But it, it really takes time. It takes tradition. It takes knowledge. Wine is very important, and it's something that we can even work always more in the course of time. So to say a stupid thing, there's varieties of grapes that were born in one place but actually grow better in another place like Montepulciano. Montepulciano is a grape and is the name of a city in Tuscany. There's Montepulciano in Tuscany, but then they grow Montepulciano, the same grape, in other regions and actually comes better just because the climate of the position of the territory, the minerals in the ground, they're just better for that kind of grape. So the wine world is crazy, versatile, is unlimited growing. We can always grow, we can always get better. And Italy and France are the two two countries that put the most study into it, that put the most, that have actually, they're lucky to have the most traditions into it because in Napa Valley now they put in a lot of money, but money doesn't buy at all. Yeah. still have limits. Well, I mean, yeah, you need, you definitely need that tradition. You need that time. And I mean, we're still, we're just, uh, we were talking about it earlier in the conversation. We're a young country in general. So as, you know, as time Mm -hmm. passes, if, you know, we have a thousand year old beer company or like a wine company, a Napa Valley company, they'll be like, been here for a thousand years now try our wine it's been mm-hmm. like we've worked out the kinks we've done these things i mean yeah that just comes with time exactly it does and i'm very happy to see how napa valley is growing how valle de guadalupe is growing i don't understand too much the cost of it because i can get cheaper very good wine from italy than buying it from valle de guadalupe or napa valley that's my complaint actually right now today but today's day i don't know why it's the same price it should be cheaper but but it's very promising where it's going. Like it's going to grow to a great point for sure. California, it attracted me at the beginning because it's the only region in America that actually has a real good agriculture. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, The weather is really good. Now, yeah, we have problem with the drought, but it's getting better. Obviously we need water, but it really has very good agriculture. It has good produce. Uh, the the vegetables here is pretty good. The fruit here is pretty good, and I love that because I come from where it's the main thing. Like agriculture is all we fucking do in Italy. It's tomatoes, wine, it's olive oil. Dude. That's where we stand. Like yeah. that's all we do. In a way, we don't even do fucking coffee. Like we just finish it. We buy it from Brazil. And, yeah, but we finish it off nice. Dude, you do. I, I will <laughs> say, when you were telling me about the the Italian coffee just being Brazilian, and then mm-hmm. when I went to Casa uh, uh, Cafe del Taza de Oro, they I looked and there was like three bags of Brazilian single origin. I was like, oh, yeah. dude, I have like that same bag at my shop. I was like, <laughs> dude, I know exactly what they're doing. <laughs> like, yeah. it was sick. To, then they had the roaster in the back too. Mm-hmm. Dude, the cappuccinos and the espressos at that yeah. spot. Yeah, they're so really good. There. good. Oh they're my really god. Good. Yeah, man. There's it, a couple of shops in Rome that make crazy espresso. Crazy espresso. I miss that. That's dude, maybe one of the main things. Have I miss. you been to Tram Depot? No. Tram Depot is like a mile from the Coliseum. Tram Depot. Yeah, and they don't speak English there. And so I learned how to say it. I was like, do we espresso por favore? <laughs> and it's like, Okay. Uh, <laughs> sick. I'd be like sick. And then that's all I learned how to say how to order was coffee. And it was so fun. But then we went to uh Roscoe de Oli's or uh Rosholi. Yeah. Rosholi. I went to a that's couple of those. Good. That's good. Dude, that one, the Tram Depot, um Tazo de Oro, um Santo Stacchio, have you been? Is in the center. Dude, Santo maybe. Stacchio. They they're famous because they kind of put a mix of egg yolk and sugar inside, like a sort of zabayone to finish off their coffee, at which it creates a double layer of cream. Whoa, uh, it's it's pretty good. It's different though. They had like that in the Chacarados. It's Chacarado, yes. Chacarado. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, those are dude. I yeah, looked those at those. Too. I was like, I don't know if I can fuck with that. Yeah. <laughs> dude, those it's are kind of dark. Yeah. <laughs> it's good for the summer, like a summer drink. Hell yeah. After I had espresso, like. Before, give me the real shit there. All right, all right. <laughs> Dude, but so now you, I didn't know all this stuff. 
So, you know, you have a pretty big social media presence. You're obviously uh, a bit of a character, but you're not f faking the funk. This is just who you are. Yeah. I don't prepare anything. Like this podcast, man. That, dude, I, I know. know what I had to do. I love it. I you're love like, it. It was funny. Like, we're live on the Instagram. Like, he, he told me before, I sent you an email with all the things. I'm like, fuck. I look at Luigi <laughs> that is filming, <laughs> and I'm like, fuck. I, knew I had to read the fucking email. I didn't read it, but fuck it. I'll just do it. You're all, let me read the questions. <laughs> yeah, can, I, can I read the questions? Cause I, know, I don't know what's coming. That's fine. Dude, Boy. now, um, the one thing I also wanted to talk to you about. So when after we had I actually come to eat at your restaurant, and you know we, we were giving coffee and stuff, you were telling me about the pizza. Yeah. Tell me, tell the, changer, tell the man. listeners, tell everybody who's listening out there, what is the deal? It's different than pizza. It's P I N S A. It is. It is. it is. So I'll start like this. I'll say at the end of the day, it's the same shit. It's what we're doing is a pizza. Is as, as pizza as you know it. The real difference is in the method. This is why we, not we, all the movement of pizza want to give a different name, want to give a different shape. Like you came to the restaurant, you know, that when I give a pizza at our restaurant is oval shaped. Yeah. It's not the classic round shape. And we don't do that because it's really different. We do that to differentiate from regular pizza because in a way I am, this is only me, I'm on a personal war against pizza. Pizza, <laughs> I swear to God, I don't eat pizza, man. Pizza is a fucked up item that came out of Italian cuisine and became one of the biggest business in the world. Maybe, uh, I have to say, it's maybe number one business in the food world ever. Like, it's the biggest shit you can think about. What's the food most sold in pizza? There's nothing. That's just fucking water and flour and yeast. Like, it's the most sold item ever. So for me to go in a war against pizza, it's, it's kind of crazy. I might die before I w win this war. <laughs> but... <laughs> What happened is I kind of applied a little bit of my background in college and a little bit of the idea that my parents really pushed the fuck on me of you have to still study. Like whatever you do in life, you still have to study like what's going on. If you can do whatever job you're doing from fixing cars to being the CEO of fucking Facebook, but you have to study what you're doing. And on that, they were super right. And still at my today, like, I study when I cook. I go to see what really happens in the chemical reactions when, when you cook a vegetable, when you cook pasta, when you cook anything you're cooking, a chicken for yourself, you're activating chemical reactions. You're blending recipes together to come to a final product. Now, how do we apply on pizza this? Pizza is a chemical reaction, is a natural yeast, even if they put dry yeast, is a natural yeast that goes and eats the sugars, the proteins, the amino acids, everything that we find into flour, that is the white powder that we mix with the water and the yeast to make our dose. Now, what happens in this? The, the yeast needs to have time to eat all of the sugars, to eat all of the proteins, and what it really does, he farts. He simply, <laughs> I know everybody laughs about that, but it's that simple. He farts and yeah, he creates those gases, which create what we know as levitation. When they, when you follow a fucking YouTube video, it's like, you want to make bread at home, dude? Put water, water, uh, water, flour, salt, leave it outside two hours. It will double up, cook it. Fucked up. Yeah, obviously it will double up because what's happening? You're pushing at a very high temperature, which is the outside temperature, which is too high. You're pushing the yeast to eat the sugars, eat the proteins, and then fart. His farts stay inside the glutenic shield, which is an exterior uh, protection that keeps everything inside, and it rises because those farts, those air, they stay inside, but they make the dough become double up, and it doubles up. What's the bad thing about this? Is you're not really giving that yeast the right time to eat all of the proteins, all of the sugars, to separate the particles of gluten inside of the flour. So why should you do this? Because our body, our digestion system is not that perfect. It's not that strong. Christians that want to say we're perfect, we're not fucking perfect. We die when we're 20, man. We're not fucking perfect. Yeah. Like people die of a heart attack at 21. People ha die of cancer at 42. People like, we're not fucking perfect. Don't bullshit me. We're not perfect. And our intestine is not perfect. We cannot digest everything. 
the way we're making bread, the may the way we're eating in the last fifty year years is kind of killing us. Is not treating us good. Why you have all these people today? Oh, I'm gluten free. Oh, I can't digest anything. You're not fucking gluten free. You, if you're celiac, bring me your doctor's fucking thing because you have to have a card when you're celiac that tells me you're celiac. 0.01% of the whole population is really celiac, that you cannot eat gluten. Everybody else is fucking fixed in their mind that they want to be gluten-free because they have to get slim for summer. It, <laughs> that's a different game. Anyways, I still, even if you want to go on that diet, fine. Don't eat pizza. You're right because pizza is fucking full of gluten. And the way they make pizza is totally fucked up. 99% of shops that make pizza... And I'll go singularly on one restaurant in San Diego, Tribute Pizza. I love their fucking pizza. It's really good. I know how the owner makes the dough. He's great. He does a great job. So the other 99% of the restaurants, so me and Tribute, the other 99, don't eat their shit. I do not suggest you to eat their shit because as much as you can say it flavors good, I know the flavor is good. I know the fucking flavor is good. You know how many things I can give you that flavor is good and I'll kill you right there? You'll die in 30 minutes. <laughs> like what, the, what, what answer is the flavor is good, you idiot? Like, like, do you know what you're putting in your mouth? Which it doesn't work with our body. Yeah. So many different things to realize. You'll feel full with your stomach. You'll feel thirsty. You'll feel heavy. You'll feel sick. All of these things is because we're not made to really digest this dough of pizza. When I see Detroit pizza, when I see Chicago pizza, I don't want to play the Italian chef that is disgust, disgusted by other version of the original pizza. No, because I'll tell you this. I'm giving shit to the original fucking pizza. The original pizza is the Naples-style pizza. My father was born five miles from where pizza was born. That thing is bullshit. You don't <laughs> have to eat that fucking shit. Do not eat Naples' original traditional style stage of pizza that's fucked up it comes from times when people didn't have the knowledge they didn't go on the chemical level to see how at, to see how particles divide to see how yeast eats sugar they didn't know shit i get to talk with pizza yolos they're 70 years old and like i've been doing this for 65 years in my life now you want to come and tell me this is not good for me yeah motherfucker 65 <laughs> years of your life, you threw them in the fucking shit. Yeah, motherfucker. You're a, fat, <laughs> you're a fat pizza chef that you're fat because you eat the shit that you make. Yeah. And you know how it really, this is kind of funny. Like in Italy, they tell you don't trust a chef that is skinny. What? Man, it's fucked up. Don't trust a fat motherfucker. Yeah. Because the fat motherfucker right. means he doesn't eat well. Yeah, bro. It means he's not eating good. And that motherfucker is making your food, piece of shit. So don't <laughs> eat from him. Why the fuck should you trust a fat chef? Yeah. I'm actually I'm as fat as I can get in my life because I'm going through a phase of I want sugar. Uh -huh. But I don't look at my diet. But everybody has his bad moments. I was, like I try to predicate good. It doesn't mean I do all good. I, like, I feel It's you. better if you don't smoke, but I smoke. Like, fuck it. Like, it's still one life and everything. I understand this. But in general, like, what we're trying to give to the people is the right dough of making bread. It's not only pizza. Pizza is one of the parts. The thing that scares me is even bread because every human being in the fucking planet eats bread. Yep. A mix of water and flour. There's not one other food that brings us all together more than bread. Really isn't. Nothing in the world that makes us as common as bread. Every fucking body eats bread. And so that's every the, culture. Every culture, every the poorest fucking country in Africa knows that there's bread because you mix a flour and a water is the easiest thing you can do. And so it I believe is the most important thing to work in in our life like we have to make bread available digestible good for you the what's the unfortunate thing people just think about the flavor oh i've been to that restaurant in liberty station in san diego that was the pizza was good no motherfucker that pizza was shit <laughs> The pizza was shit. shit. So what are you doing then to make it different what do you do when you're when you're letting your uh your bread when you're cooking your bread, what do you do? Like, do you Perfect. you have a you have a certain way of cooking yeah. it? Like a certain amount of hours. I have a strict recipe, and I have a strict 
procedure more than a recipe. Uh, I have a very strict procedure into making bread. Uh, I have to give the yeast the correct time he needs. So, so first of all, we start from the main ingredient, flour. Uh, I'll tell you very fastly this. America is a continent, so from Alaska all the way down to Argentina and Peru and all of them, there's only six types of grains that we know about in all of America. And the best one is Manitoba from Canada. The other five, so sorry General Mills, you can sue me for this, but General Mills, all of the flour they do is fucking shit. <laughs> it, they, it comes from only five kinds of grain that we know as today, and you can Wikipedia this, that I'm saying is in Italy we have more than 1,146, this is what my mind is telling me right now, it's around that, but 1,150 types of grain that we know about from which we can choose. How do we choose? Based on quality, based on strength on the flour so that we can do different things because you need a strength of flour to do bread, you need a strength of flour to do pizza, you need a strength of flour to do pastry shit, cookies or shit like that. Interesting. You need a, a flour strength to do pasta. All the flours that we, you, you need for these different things need to be different. I cannot give you a pasta with a bread flour. Why? You won't digest it. Then you'll be, wow, that pasta was fucking heavy, man. Yeah, obviously, in my bread flour, there's so many proteins that once I put it in your body, you don't digest it. So this is when studying really becomes main focus. It becomes really important. This is, how can I know how strong is a grain if I don't go down to the chemical level and I study what's happening? So every pizza yolo there was in the last 100 years, he didn't go, fuck, he didn't know how much strength of the flour there was in that flour. He didn't know shit. He didn't know the process. He just saw that he left the dough out two hours. It doubled up. He was ready to go. That's what he taught. And this is how really pizza is developed, how bread is developed. But luckily, we got to a point of history where uh, common knowledge is there. Like we, You can go on Google. You can go on YouTube, and you can be a fucking lawyer today. You can see everything. <laughs> you really right? can do whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, somebody's getting pissed, but you can be whatever you want. If you're in YouTube and you do, you pay $100 for a master class and you become whatever you want. But I'm happy about how much knowledge there is today because it really makes available for me even the understanding that most of things are fucked up and I have to fight against what's fucked up. Fight against ignorance. It, it mostly is ignorance. It's something that I always hated even when I was a kid that I was looking at old people in small countries that super ignorant, that give shit to young people because, oh, you don't know how it was 50 years ago when we used to eat fucking mouses all around because we were in the war and we fight the war. All of this doesn't apply with my life, man. Like, we're looking at the future. We're going something... We should be looking at something even better. Try to make the world even better. We're not by say by giving them a solid bread. Yes. Yes. That's that's my little role. In the, <laughs> in the fucking million people working in the world. That's my little role. So is that the main focus of your restaurant? Is to make the pizza and give people you know because your ingredients that you're putting on top of that pizza are not your normal like uh, in, uh, ingredients. You you have figs on there. You have arugula. Mm -hmm. You have very, very tricky. tasty ingredients. Yeah, tricky, tricky question because honestly, it's my personal main focus, but it's not my restaurant main focus. My business, my restaurant main focus is to give the most higher experience possible I can give you. I'm limited by money available. Like I would love to have five hostesses to give you a blowjob when you come in, but <laughs> I don't have the money for that, and I'm sorry, <laughs> man, but whatever I can do to actually enhance your experience from the appetizer to, I'm, I'm talking a lot about pizza, but I'm more of a chef, all-around chef. I love pastry, I love appetizers, I love main courses, so what really I focus in my restaurant is to actually try to push people to do tasting menus because okay. that's where we can express ourselves. I can express totally myself in everything that we do because for me, it's not only how I cook a bread, even how I cook an artichoke is very important. Nobody in the fucking world knows how to cook artichokes. That's a plain, simple thing. Like every customer that I had and I gave them to eat the stem of the artichokes, they were like, well, do you eat the stem of the artichokes? It's the fucking best part, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Eat it. <laughs> I'll sh I'm going to show you. I'm going to get educated. I'm happy to educate you on we Why can eat so everything. Good. Why yeah. it's so good. Why it's actually so good for you. It's not only a flavor thing. It's like 
you're getting some some nutritional facts that you don't really get. Uh, you have to get pills to get fucking vitamin E that you find in artichoke. It's, it's not easy. The iron that you find in arch, artichokes, not easy to actually intake in your body and uh, on a daily basis. So very happy to actually show you that, yeah, you're going to eat the fucking stem. So, you know, you're dropping this. This actually triggers something for me because in roasting, uh, there's a lot of knowledge. I just took two different, three different classes over the last two days and I feel invigorated and I want my coffee roasting to just like be better. Do you, you also said earlier in the conversation, you're always have to learn. You always have mm -hmm. to keep learning on what you're doing, you know, to stay relevant or just to keep it going, just to keep your brain, your brain functional. Do you think that like, or, or do you still learn and search out those facts of just your ingredients and what, what new like nutritional value you're really giving your customers mm -hmm. and is that part of your daily 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 yes. daily 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 where do you get it'll, your it'll be until i die like there's no arriving point i'm happy i like the fact that there's no arriving point i talk with a chef who now is dead last year uh, gualtero marquez in italy he was 81 and i was lucky to do a couple events with him and i was like man what's really like the biggest chef suggestion you can give to somebody is like don't wait for something to end for this profession to end it's unlimited i still learn from 18 years old motherfuckers and i'm 81 i've been cooking for 70 years i still can learn from an idiot that is 18 years old and there's no finishing into the learning process and it kind of it it's cool like do you so wow. you actually are pulling from you know, you could still learn from your line chef that's 18 to Absolutely. to your sous chef who might, you know, is it like... Mm -hmm. Not only from people, even from, I can learn from YouTube, I can learn from Google, I can learn from a book, I can learn from a video. Netflix is going fucking nuts with all these videos online and chef's tables and mm -hmm. it's crazy. The m amount of kitchen that you see of food that you see of knowledge, even the regular people, like when people look at Netflix, like don't you see the fucking difference? Like you, oh, yeah. now it's on the screens at your house. Like there is a difference. It's possible. Like, it it's shows possible. people that yeah. it's fucking possible. Yeah, there's much more going on than fucking Domino's Pizza. Oh, and definitely. again, I'm gonna get sued by Domino's. Nah, too. let's do it. Nah, man. but like there, it's also a passion. I mean, people are able to see your passion now. People are able to see, they're, they're gonna be able to hear your passion, see your passion right now, mm -hmm. just even doing the podcast. I mean, you know what? You know, all that being said, you have all this natural energy, and you've done these amazing things. What keeps you like driven? What keeps you insp inspired? Is it new ways of cooking? Is it new ways to give nutrition to people? Or is it just a personal thing that you're like, you want to get stoked? Mostly is I won't win the fight that I'm fighting, but I, I want to live my life trying to make people understand and caring more for the simple act of eating and food. And it, it might come from something so traditional that I have inside that is really the act of fucking transforming food into something edible, really good for us. I love the fact that you eat with your eyes too. Like when you go to a fancy restaurant and they play a dish in a beautiful way, that's very important for your act of eating. Like your, your mind is already telling you, wow, that's fucking good. And you still haven't tried it. Like, But your mind already upset you and wow that's fucking good that's gonna be good and my strive into is into having people realizing like wow okay you were right like every time people think that even tell me but people think and i see it he was right that's when i fulfill a lot another brick in my fucking wall of life and i know there's no arriving there's no end and I'll continue on that. It's every block that I put on, it, it strives me. Like every time I have a customer coming to me, it's like, oh, you know, I've eaten in the best restaurants in the world. I've been traveling and this dinner was among one of the best restaurants, one of the most best diners. But, but fucking block in my life makes, strives me to go another year. Sick. And yeah. Dude, that's badass, man. I mean, I can get shit. Huh? I want to say this. Sometimes I get shit. Nah, yeah, for <laughs> sure. For sure. I mean, I bet you do. I mean, everybody does. There's, yeah. Everybody has critics, so whatever. Yeah, absolutely. You know, being your own worst one, though, too. I mean, somebody who's as driven as you are, I would imagine you're probably a lot harder on your own self than, I am. I am. than I am. anybody I am. else. Like, I am. 
I feel that way all the time. I, I, yeah, I am. I arrive to points in which I actually have to re-motivate myself and think even if everybody's saying something, you are, you are still right. Fight your way through. Even if your wife, I, I fight with my wife all the time, all the time about business things. And I know I have to keep stubborn. I have to keep my head where my mentality wants me to be because at the end, I'm the really only one doing it. Not only one, but I'm the really one doing it by passion. I don't look at money. I don't even know how much money I have. I have no idea how much money I have. If I didn't have my wife, I might be on the fucking streets, like lost with no house because I don't care about money. It's not because I have so much that, not even close. It's not because I have so much that I don't care. I just don't care. I don't give a fuck. Like money for me is just a method to live my life. I need it to live my fucking life, so I have money. I have to have money. But I hate it. I hate to ask you money when you come to the restaurant. Like I always want to give discounts. Like like th this is one of the main reasons why I fight with my life with my wife. I give discounts to everybody. I just like it. I I. It's not because I feel like. You don't have to pay for what you've done, or my work deserves more, so I have to make you pay more. I'm like, fuck it. Why make it so hard on people just to eat? Like, I'll give you a discount. You want an extra <laughs> glass of wine? Just call me and give you an extra glass of <laughs> yeah. wine. I really don't care. Like, fuck it. Yeah. And I'm sure whoever came to the restaurant and got to know me, they know it's like that. They look at me and they're like, you have a glass of wine? <laughs> I'm like, fuck it. Yeah. Get a glass of wine. <laughs> dude, well, I mean, yeah, coming from uh, Italy specifically, I mean, we were talking about it. It's like, dude, it's so much cheaper to get wine oh, yeah, there. Wine I mean, in general, yeah. Dude, you not in America. Drink, though. Um, no, not in America <laughs> at all. But like, you, if you're in. Yeah. Italy, I could totally see how that could be something that you get used to doing because, yeah. I mean, honestly, bro, I, the whole time we it's were there, true. we were there for a week and I swear I drank more wine than I did water every single day. I didn't even, dude, I haven't smoked a cigarette, like a full cigarette in years. And then yeah. I got, dude, after like four or five days in Italy, we ended up getting, we were in Florence we were at this point. We got out of our spot at like nine or whatever. We went to Giostro. It's like the best restaurant in Florence or something like that. And we got out and there was like a fucking just alley full of dudes just like – or kids. It was at this little bar on the side street and they were just drinking in the street, smoking cigs. And I was all, dude, I'm going to fucking – yeah. I'm just going to get some wine and I'm going to fucking smoke this cig. And mm -hmm. it was like, yeah, I shouldn't be smoking this cigarette, but damn, this is hella sick, bro. Mm -hmm. Italy, it's lit. Like – I can understand how just giving out wine like that is totally chill. Dude, we got a piece too. Yeah, it's all good, G. Dude. Now, I actually wanted to ask you something too. So one thing that was really interesting to me was I heard something when I was watching like a, a, a chef show once. And they said, do you consider yourself an artist that cooks or are you um, a cook that you would consider yourself an artist? Okay, that's a cool one. A cool question. Are you a, a cook that considers yourself an artist or you're an artist that considers yourself a cook? Well, I kind of feel bad about saying this, but I feel like if I'm an artist that whatever I really focus into doing, I'll put my artistry into. So yeah, I'm I'm not a cook at base. I was not born as a chef. Like It was something, as I said before, it didn't really come from... I had it inside or a moment where I said, I'm a chef, so I'll be a chef. No, it's it's more my my inner self. And I'll say my artistry, not as saying I'm an artist, but whatever I do, I try to put my art, my personal art into, and that's whatever I do. Like, I, I could be like you making coffee. I could get a down passion for making coffee and start making coffee. Uh, this thing of pizza just came out after I was I was doing chef and I think there is a crazy amount of artistry into pizza crazy amount because you really like we were saying before about like kind of metaphysical energy you put in the food you're mm -hmm. making like there's some food that really feel your vibe that really change the flavor based on your fucking humor and i think there is a good 80 percent of real chemical reaction into that which it it's trans uh, transported by our sweat so it's physically happening it's chemically happening this energy energy movement but there's even a spiritual uh movement that it comes it starts from our mind for sure where 
my good vibe will make a better pizza my my good having like i'm having a great day and i'm loving what i'm doing for the people i'm sure you'll get a better product at, at the end of the day hell yeah I, I see it a lot of though with those with pasta with pizza mostly even for the chemical fact because this is something it's kind of nasty maybe to say but when you use a lot your hands you really are transporting be with the sweat of your hands flavor into what you're doing it's kind of <laughs> fucking weird and I, I know but people like it because like if i work a dough a lot with my hands i am putting something on me in in that dough yeah sorry Skin for everybody cells, eating yeah, it whatever. but it's true like it's well that's why you cook it <laughs> that's why don't worry it's only me don't worry so i, I wash my I, I take a couple of showers today no, <laughs> not sure maybe one and but anyways really there's a there's a connection between the food you're actually cooking and the person that is actually cooking it that that's for sure like i have no doubt about that and i am pretty much spiritual as a person but i don't believe in too much of the bullshit yeah like church never convinced me yeah i'm not catholic i i come from the fucking nuclear of the church and i'm yeah. not catholic so i know the pope uh, he's my fucking neighbor yeah. <laughs> but he's my really he's my fucking neighbor so i know him and they didn't convince me sorry there's yeah. no religion in the world actually well, dude, no, listen, me, like, i was just talking about this yesterday and it was about that specifically like what i personally believe is like i don't believe in religion i just mm. don't i you know but then there's like the super gnarly spiritual types i'm like i'm not really fucking with that either but where mm -hmm. i find what i kind of like make sense in my mind is that whether it's spiritual people or religious people or people who are just kind of like where i'm at the one thing that's constant and everybody every single fucking person on this planet talks about it you can feel it it's there's a, yes it's energy it. bro energy, uh, yes. on the real so no that's what I believe in. And and that's just proven shit. I mean, out in the universe mm -hmm. and all this like planets and mass and energy and doing these things and blah, 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 blah. You could be a science geek or somebody who's just like, yo, yo, G, I'm not feeling your vibe, son. <laughs> like, yo, what I'm saying? Like, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Trans it's however universal. you want to translate it, it's universal. And that's the shit I believe in. And that's why I think, you know, if you're putting personally for me, yo, like I've been listening to a lot of hip hop or a lot of reggaeton, like we were talking about earlier. That shit has been making my like my coffees taste just like a little bit like more smooth, I feel mm -hmm. like, or a little bit more like steezy. Or if like one day I might be feeling not so hot, if I'm doing a super dark roast, it comes out like too roasty and just kind of negative and I'm, oh, damn it, <laughs> fuck that one up, you know? But that's the one thing I've, I've had a constant, I feel, um, a, uh, something in common with cooks. Mm-hmm or chefs in the sense of not just coffee roasters, but you know, you're actually physically in it. I don't get to, I get to touch the green. Mm -hmm. I roast it and then I get to touch everything else after that. But that even just like the energy that I'm using to focus on roasting is that's my energy applied to that. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one thing everybody can vibe on, especially when it comes to making things for other people. Mm -hmm. And you're really like, in, like um, putting yourself into putting the, yourself uh, into it you're implying your your personality your persona your your positivity or your negativity whichever way you do it mm -hmm. it's all something that uh it can be taken positively negatively but also at the same time it can be something that's it's a uh, transforming it's inspiring too people can taste it and they're like yo this is the best coffee i've ever had this is the best pizza i've ever had it's the best your dessert you've ever had that uh you made that's your ode to bacon and eggs mm -hmm. like, yeah that dish egg. <laughs> dude that thing is next level and you eat it and it's lemon meringue with like this sweet lemon or something like that and then you this have meat <laughs> yeah and then just uh pork belly mm -hmm. and it's next level <laughs> so i think that's yeah man i think that's something that's it's inspiring and it's super it's really awesome to see you putting the, all this effort into it now would you say this is just the beginning since you guys have, you know, you're not that old yet. It's a year and five months, but do you, do you think you have other things in mind? Like, uh, things for the future of the restaurant or maybe yourself, you know, you have a pretty strong social media mm -hmm. presence. It's really a step one of a hundred. Okay. It's one of a hundred. And we're really out to, 
mostly even the main reason why I opened the restaurant is to continue building brand authority because I want the M of the logo, not really myself, not really. Marco Mestoso is not the main focus of the company. Marco Mestoso can be the face. Marco Mestoso can be the, the chef. But what really, in a way, needs to grow is the M of the logo is brand authority. And what I mean is one day, whatever we will do, we'll produce quality. We'll produce healthiness. We'll produce good food that will be out there for you. So whatever we will do, and we're focusing on big sectors this is why we're going into pizza this is why we're always looking into stuff like coffee like big sectors to develop and to actually bring to masses like my real goal and we were joking about exactly with him today about the pizzas like and i told them joking like as soon as we signed the first one million dollar contract for because we're selling pizzas retail uh, actually, I want to talk about that in just a second. Yeah, like the pizzas that we do at the restaurant, we do them oval shape, but we already sell to supermarkets and to other restaurants, and we sell our bases round shape, and without even putting my name or the logo or nothing yet. We I just want the people to eat good shit, so it's going out, it's in supermarkets, and it's in restaurants and whatever. But my final goal, it is actually to put a brand on it, to brand them out, and to sell to supermarkets, to sell to normal people. And I was telling them today, we signed a fucking million dollar contract. We're going to Africa with like 10,000 or one th whatever the number is, basis, and we go with distributed pizza to all over. Like, I really, like, as a goal, like, really, this is step one of 100 to just open a fucking restaurant that has the brand image. Then all the products, all the work, all the different projects that we can do, they will all stick together and they will come together. But there is an infinity things that we have to do. I, I feel that we have to. It's like a must. It's not like you want to grow your brand because you want to do shit. I have to. Like I'm, I'm on a duty here. Like I'm fighting a war against pizza. Perfect. I have to win the fuck. I, I have to fight that fucking war. I have to win it. I'll try to win it, but I won't win it. But... I have to fight the fucking war. So we have to go out there with selling billions of this fucking pizza crust or, and it's not about the money. It's, it really is because we need to make everybody's life better. Uh, we make, we grow the company and we go even on other sections. We'll start maybe with you guys selling coffee or we we'll start, start selling our tomato sauce and start selling grow um, wholesale, bigger stuff the brand the restaurant itself he's at step one of 102 and mainly is just confidential talking is we didn't invest enough money we don't have enough money to put into the restaurant but in a little bit we'll attract people like fucking rich people in california there's so many man <laughs> i'm gonna just grab another one and say put 100 200 whatever million dollars in the fucking place we'll make it better and it's all about right now, I, as I see it, restaurants, even in San Diego, what I critique mostly, what I play around when on my Instagram is people prefer to put a picture on Instagram that they're out eating and the fancy restaurant downtown in San Diego, much more thinking about what is the fancy restaurant serving me. Like they don't even get a fuck about the food that is coming out. It's crazy how the new restaurant owners are spending like eight to $10 million on a location and the food fucking sucks. How can you spend $8 million and the food sucks? You have fucking 40 chefs down there. You have 40 waiters, 40 chefs. Everything is so beautiful. I can take a million pictures on Instagram and I can have 300 likes right now as the picture, as I post the picture, and then the food fucking sucks. Like, that makes me crazy. Crazy, oh, yeah, crazy, dude, crazy. I'd be pumped. Crazy. You're so bummed. You're paying like yeah. 800 bucks for a dinner, and then it's like, That's yo, crazy. what did you? It's like, yo, I'm yeah. so hungry though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like, there's so many, like all the new ones, and I can, but we can't. I want to. I don't want to say names. No, you have to say no all, names. All the new ones in Little Italy, they're all from the same group. They're spending like millions on each restaurant. Then you go there, the food is like bullshit. Like, why are you even spending all this money? Just focus on what's important, and then you have money. Cool, make the cool place, but still give me good fucking food. Yeah, they just rely on the fact that people don't even look about the food they're eating anymore. They pre really prefer about taking the picture, commenting, of being cool that I'm here because the restaurant's super busy. Oh, I waited 45 minutes to get in to eat a fucking bullshit pizza or sandwich or pasta or whatever it is or steak. 
Mm-hmm. Idiot. <laughs> Fucking idiot. I'll slap your shit out of your face if I see you. <laughs> like, it's just stupid. Like, no, I get it. I mean, the thing with social media, I mean, we're, we're both doing it. We have to do it to do things like we're doing right now. But then when it comes down to it, dude, if I don't have to promote for the show or just like coffee roasting or whatever, like my phone's in the other room. Mm-hmm. Like, dude, I can't. Like, I need to put it yeah. down. It's become so gnarly. I can't, dude, I cannot be one of those people taking f- fucking pictures of my food. Like, I can't be doing that. I'll videotape you talking shit at the restaurant, serving me the food, because yeah. that's that hilarious. Is, yeah. But <laughs> me going yeah. like, oh, look it, I'm eating this. You know, like, <laughs> and then have it on your tile on your shit. Unless you're a food blogger, I don't want to see nothing. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh-huh. I'm just my, kidding. Sorry, people. <laughs> my, my, my Instagram of my stuff is actually my personal. Like, I have no Instagram my stuff. I have a Facebook page because otherwise my mother will kill me, but I don't post anything. There's one post every six months. And the Instagram, I'm always on Instagram. Yeah. I'm not saying, fuck social media, I don't use it. No, I use it and a lot. And yeah. I love it. But I don't have a personal Instagram. That, like my life is my life I don't yeah. need to put pictures of faking that I'm at the beach or faking that I'm working so much I don't need your compassion I work as I want to work it can be 20 hours a day I don't need your compassion I can be in vacation 10 months out of the year I don't need your jealousy like fuck it like I live my life for my business though yes I can be on the, on top of that 10 hours a day Oh, 100%. if I want to because I believe in it. It's a very good way. It's the cheapest way to get to people. It's free promotion, dude. It's free promotion. It's, it's crazy. It's free. Like, think about it 15, 20 years ago. How how the fuck could you do that? The only way you had it was to pay 100 grand to go on a TV publicity advertisement during a movie that people fucking watching at 8 o'clock at night. And then there's the interruption for the commercials and you had to pay 100 grand to fucking be on that. That's, yep. no, that's no 100 grand on Instagram. Yeah. Like if you spend two hundred dollars a month, you say you get in that hundred grand you used to pay for twenty years ago. Yep. I mean, dude, the thing too is like with YouTube. I mean, we were talking about that earlier in the conversation. Dude, I learned how to do all of this straight through Google, mm-hmm. reading articles, and fucking YouTube. Yeah. Dude, it's amazing the free shit you could do. I mean, my friend Chauncey, uh, he told me one time, he said, "Dude, get the basics, but then everything else just learn on YouTube." He's mm-hmm. like. If you were going to go to college and it's you have to pay for the all the money that's going to take you just to go for like one semester, which ends up being like 400 bucks. It's like, okay, mm-hmm. cool, whatever. But he's he's all, what do you go? How many days a week you go? It's like, oh, twice. Monday, Wednesday from 6 to 8, 15, both times. It's like, okay. Find all the information online. Study for two hours and 15 minutes <laughs> At <home>. twice a <laughs> week. Yeah. Same shit for free. And it's... I've learned through doing, I don't know how many of these I've done. I don't know what number. I think you're going to be like 58 or 59. Nice. Over the the course of doing these, I've learned how to, you know, do breakdowns faster, reading articles about how to do sound and everything. So it's, mm-hmm. it's it got it always better. It's than. always, dude. I mean, but all that being said, it's still like running the social media at the same time, doing these things and then doing this computer shit and then mm-hmm. doing the audio and it's. One man shows. I mean, you're talking about how much money you used to have to pay for all that stuff. They had teams mm-hmm. of people doing this shit. Yeah, you have to be constantly on your phone if you're really gonna make something pop off. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's your own brand. It goes yeah. back to what you were saying, brand identity, bro. Yeah. It's it's a real hustle out mm-hmm. here. That's why you came on. The have show, fun so. though. Yeah, Dude, I mean, go. I was gonna ask it's you, like, do you have fun and while you do all daily. this? It's crazy. It's do you ever daily. feel like you're working, like really working, or is this like, nah, man, this is just me living my life. I'm Actually, fun. people around me think that I'm trying to avoid my life. This is, a, and I love that people think it. And I know people like, oh, he's staying in the restaurant until late or so early because he's trying to avoid his life or he's not happy with his life. So he works in the restaurant. I fucking love it. I yeah. want to be there. I want to grow it. And that's like my office. Even if sometimes at late at night I'm not doing shit, I might smoke a joint and stay there two hours. I'm thinking, I'm braining, braining out, and I'm thinking about shit that maybe it's all wrong. And the day after, I lost two hours. Okay, fuck it. But I'm, I feel like I'm still working, but in the same way, I'm having fun. I'm cool. It's like if I'm chilling at playing FIFA with a friend at a house. Like for me, it's all at the same level. Yeah, that's. I get tough. bored with I don't have to do anything. Like, you know what I get born? That, this really brings me in trouble with my wife when she wants to go to the beach. 
She <laughs> loves going to the fucking beach and just standing on the sun and taking the sun. For me, like every second there, my life is wasted. <laughs> I'm like, fuck. I have to do something. I have to find something to do. I, and the only thing you have your phone, you start checking everything you can in your phone, but then you burn it out. And then you know every fucking article on Google News and everything. And you're like, fuck, I have to get out of here. Like, whatever. I, have to, I prefer working than being at the beach. And I hope she doesn't hear this. Yeah, by far. Yes. <laughs> by far. By fucking far. Dude, I've, <laughs> I've grown to be the same way in the sense where if I sit too idle to a, for too long, I start like I start getting up and doing something or I need to read an article or I need to do something just to keep my brain functioning. Mm-hmm. Like, Oh, I have this picture. I need to edit. I need to do this. Or I have to like work on the mm-hmm. podcast or do something like that. It's like, dude, constant. It's like, Oh, I need to go to the shop. Da, 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 da. Dude. When we had the phone calls that happened earlier when I had to like keep jumping up, that was the dude who closed the shop. So I'm assuming mm-hmm. either, he was calling because there's an emergency or <laughs> like hopefully something. Not. Yeah. Hopefully not, but <laughs> damn. Um, but it's, yeah. So I'm, I, I can completely relate. I mean, I don't own my own business like you, but you definitely give me some hope and sense. Uh, like dude, fuck, I'm just going to go I would for do, it. I always done it even for somebody else. Hard to find maybe people like me, but I, before going on my own, I was doing it for somebody else. Like it just had ethical work. And if you really believe in what you're doing, it doesn't matter for who, who or what you work. It's it's your work. It's your job. Yeah. Like you have to love what you're doing. Like you love to do coffee and maybe you don't own a percentage in seven C's. So you still love to do fucking coffee. Dude, I'd be doing coffee yeah. if I wasn't at seven C's or not. And that's but I mean, granted, don't get me wrong. That's not no way. I love being there and it's super awesome. They're a sponsor mm-hmm. of the podcast. It's great. But. Yeah, I would be doing it. If it wasn't yeah, there, I'd be doing it somewhere else. And mm-hmm. to really be able to put the passion that I want to do it in, dude, I I left like a passion project, like where I learned how to uh, coffee roast from. I left there for a position that was like high paying and mm-hmm. it was like a corporate coffee roasting position. I realized that that shit fucking sucked. Mm-hmm. It was <laughs> so garbage to like work in a warehouse by yourself Nobody else there gives a fuck about what you're doing. Mm -hmm. They're just like, roast the coffee, coffee man. Like, I'm working at a Mm -hmm. coffee company. Ain't nobody even drink coffee here. Like, or (laughs) nobody even knows, you know? So Mm -hmm. it's like, all right, fuck it. But then I go back to doing super small batch and focused on the flavors and doing these things and creating nuance and sweetness and all these things. It that's like, yeah, dude, this is where it's at. The small little shit and you can just pump it out. I mean, it gets tough on certain days, but... It's fucking legit. Mm. Yeah, I love it. I, I mean, I'd be doing it regardless, but it's really cool to be there. To Eric moves as fast as I do, so I think we balance each other out. But sometimes you can get like super scattered, scattered brain. <laughs> we're like, oh, we're both going in different directions. Like, like all it's nice. like, okay, reel it back in. So <laughs> it's like I can relate. And that's what I was trying to say. <laughs> nice. Um, so I mean, again, and then the second part of the earlier question was like with your social media. You know, you're, you're kind of um, headed in a direction that, you know, people I'm sure are taking notice of how, how, uh, how much of a personality that you are. Mm-hmm. Would you say that you're going to try to take it maybe to any type of like, is there any maybe documentaries coming out that you'd want to be like, <laughs> <laughs> like hoping for one day, like on Netflix or something? <laughs> That'd be really, really fun. Uh, I I realize I kind of, I like, I'm not as scared about cameras. I like <laughs> improvisation, even maybe a little bit more than what I should. I should organize shit better. Uh, it won't, what I can tell you, so to answer simply is yes, I like to do TV and videos and podcasts and everything. It will never become become the main thing of my life. I will never become the San Diego Brian Malarkey or the Gordon Ramsay of England or like it will never become my main focus to do TV. No, even if and again, my wife will love me to do it because you just do a show on TV, you get lots of money and then you stay home. But my work is mainly in the restaurant. My work is with the people, mostly talking to the people more than only talking through a screen is 
I really want to show better my passion when I say fuck, when I say shit, when I say, when I talk like I talk because it's really <laughs> natural. Like, I don't even know how to talk differently. Yes. And on TV, I don't even think they'll let me do all of that shit. I, I cannot really talk even as I really am. So maybe a personal TV, like something I open, an Instagram TV or something like or that. YouTube yes. channel, something like that. YouTube channel, Instagram yep. TV, something like that. I would love TV, TV, no. Uh, I've done a TV show in Italy, and I actually have done a very recently a TV show here in America that is coming out in November. Uh, I can't say shit about it. No or worries. They sue me for like eight hundred dollars, eight hundred thousand dollars. So I Jeez. can't say shit about it. Yeah, that sign up crazy fucking contract. I have to keep it even from my parents. Like it's and it's not even. It's not like I'm going on Netflix or shit like that. It's much smaller than that. But it's yeah. a TV show. It's cool. I bring brand authority. I bring authority to yes. myself, to the brand. It'll be cool for, for the brand. It'll, it's coming out in November. It's on one of the famous food sh- well, show. Definitely TV let me show. know when oh, it comes oh, out. That way we we'll can like everybody know. drink some wine, number exactly. one. And we'll then, do a party of the show. Yeah, we'll let's do a, do a party. party yeah. That'd we'll be do a showing party of the TV episode. I'd love to promote it. Yeah. Dude. Let yeah. me just shoot it over yeah. once we'll, it comes we'll out. We'll talk about it. Yes. But mainly, like, do I see myself as a TV star or a celebrity a, a, a chef? A celebrity chef, let's yeah. say that. Um, no. Like, the answer really is no. I will still be... Co- I already am without being a fucking celebrity chef. Many people are like, oh, but you're a celebrity chef. No, that's not fucking true. I don't do TV shows. I don't do... I'm not a celebrity chef. I'm just a chef. And I, I'm on Instagram a lot or Facebook or whatever, but I'm not a celebrity chef. Celebrity is like, mainly you don't cook. You fucking act. And no, I don't act. You become a judge um, on a on a cooking show or something like that. Sometimes. I don't have time for that shit. Yeah. I don't want to have time for that shit. You want to cook. You want to be yeah. in the shit. Yeah, I want to supervise. If, I, if I'm not really making the dough anymore, which I am today, and my goal in life is to not make it tomorrow, to have somebody that I pay to do it, but I'll always supervise them. And I'll always be there. A judge on a TV show, maybe once in a while, but like to be the judge of that TV show forever now, not a celebrity type of shit. Like, I think that's just acting. You get Los Angeles actors, you're not chefs. <laughs> <laughs> and in this TV show I've done, like I had these three, four, or whatever, I can't say too much, but I had yeah, these yeah, don't, judges. Don't. Yeah. And I was looking at it, I was like, fuck you judging me like who are you like you worked six years in your whole fucking life then you open a chain of shit you're full of money and this is your name and fuck you yeah. uh, <laughs> i'll continue my way sorry dude, all g man all g <laughs> well dude i mean i would say you know i think we kind of like covered everything but i mean is there any parting party things you want to leave with the people like tell them yes. where you're, where you're like any parting words, just yeah. what I'll to con- expect I'll from you. I'll continue with my tone since I started right now. And mostly what I want to say to the people, especially in a city like San Diego, that is so, uh, it's so, uh, newborn to good food. Michelin has came. Uh, actually, let's talk about this pretty fast. Michelin just came to San Diego. This Did is they? the first year ever that the Michelin guide approached Southern California. Actually, the government of California founded $500,000 for Michelin to actually come and judge different restaurants and to put them in the guide. This is great for Southern California because it kind of raised awareness on high level of cuisine. A lot of new chefs in the city are actually pushing more on the food. A lot of people are kind of investing more on the actual final product in the kitchen, on the food more than on the atmosphere, on the aesthetics. And I'm very happy that Michelin came mostly because most of the bullshit will finally end in the next five years. They will be adjusting and they will be real critics. So I'm, I must say I'm pretty hard on media. I am hard on media. I do not like the media right now in San Diego, the journal, food journal media. I don't think it's following at the same level the growth of the restaurants in San Diego. Restaurants, restaurant scene is gen, in general is growing a lot. The media journals are still the same bullshit it was 10 years ago. They still, uh, San Diego Eater is not good. It's the same it was 10 years ago. San Diego Union Tribune, San Diego Magazine. It's kind of growing a little bit better, but still they're really, 
the people that come and judge you don't really have all of that knowledge. Like, I, the thing I'm saying is when you hire somebody, you hire a food critic, he has to be a fucking food critic. Not a cute dude or cute chick that goes around and and she's a food blogger on Instagram and she writes shit about your place. Now, if you go and eat pasta to an Italian restaurant and you're a real critic, you have to know fucking pasta. You don't write bullshit about pasta. Otherwise, you're no food critic. Mm -hmm. You just... A whatever the a journalist they send you to do a food article that's very different this doesn't happen in europe like this level of journalism wouldn't be accepted in europe because just because we have more experience in standards the standards changed because we have more experience in food people have to be really educated in food and wine before judging you cannot say like i'll i'll say about 90 percent of restaurants in san diego shit and I continue, I continue to go out and I continue to eat shit. I continuously eat, eat shit, eat shit, eat shit. And I don't even talk about it. Like, I keep it to myself. Otherwise, people will tr truly kill me. They'll fucking come in my house and shoot me. But it, it's really like we need to get it better and we need to get the food better. And Michelin is working on that. It, the, the fact of the Michelin is working towards that. But even the food journalism on the city needs to go at the same speed and make the city grow. Like, you have to enlighten the city. You know what? I want to give shit to a person right here, right now, a journalist, and I don't give a fuck. And Michelle Parente, she's a journalist from San Diego Union Tribune. She should get a fuck out of food right <laughs> now because she wrote some articles during this year. I was ashamed about being in San Diego. I had to rethink my whole fucking living in San Diego. I was like, was it why about the you? fuck am I here? No, oh, about just... food in general. Oh, okay. She wrote an article about Italian restaurants. She wrote, I've given around Italian restaurants. I couldn't find 10 good Italian restaurants in all of San Diego. In her list, there was the Olive Garden. So we were not into, and whatever. I'm not jealous I was oh not in the list. But for sure, listen, you know what? At the end of the day, I'm a fucking chef. I know how to judge food. I'm in the top 10 restaurants, Italian restaurants in San Diego. Fuck it. I can say that. Because I can personally judge my food, and I'll tell you, I'm top three Italian restaurants in San Diego by far. But anyways, she wrote this thing, like there's no 10 good Italian restaurants in San Diego. I could find only seven. One of the seven was the fucking Olive Garden. Yeah, and that's I, crazy. And I, I will not say other names because they'll get pissed at me, but yeah. Olive Garden, fuck them. They're a big company. I can get them shit, but it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous that you are a San Diego journalist writing for a San Diego journal giving shit to every restaurant in your city. You know what that does? Only bad on the national national media. It just kills your fucking city. You're going against your own city. Instead of enlightening new young people opening Italian restaurants, it's full right now. I'm not saying they're all good. I'm saying it's full. Go look for them, motherfucker. Go lose time around it. Go learn what the fuck is pasta. I wrote another article from another of them, super famous journalist. This I cannot even say the name. He wrote an article saying if you put egg yolk into pasta, the pasta is fucked up because it overcooks when you cook it. In that moment there, you piece of motherfucking shit. You gave, <laughs> you gave shit to a whole fucking country, to my own country where I come from. You just threw shit in our face. And you're lucky that Italy is not here, otherwise they'll fucking shoot your head down for something <laughs> as stupid as that to say. What all of the shit to say? What? Get informed before you even talk about that. Yeah. Because you're a journalist. That what you should do in your life. I'm not telling you that you you roast coffee beans and, and you want to talk shit about pasta, whatever. You are a food journalist. You go into critic an Italian restaurant. You don't talk shit about pasta in general you can't because you just look stupid for me reading you look stupid for an ignorant or whoever that doesn't know and is reading you're actually given misinformation you're given bad information things that is not true but people that don't know they'll believe it they'll say oh shit i'll never eat pasta with egg again inside <laughs> Oh, you know what? The best pasta in the world in Modena. Massimo Bottura is number one chef in the whole fucking world, man. He's famous for pasta. And there's egg. 32 egg yolks and one kilo of pasta. It's fucking full of fucking eggs. Full. It's all eggs. And a little bit of flour. So, shut the fuck up. Don't write stuff <laughs> like that. Like, I'm disgraced about that. I, I don't want to be judged by them. 
I love your passion. I love your passion about pasta. (laughs) Yeah, about pasta really is. Let me say the last thing. We are, in 2019, best Italian restaurant in San Diego by San Diego Magazine Critics Choice. I didn't even put any news out on the media. I didn't put any sign on the restaurant, which everybody would have done. I see it all around. When I go to restaurant, I see San Diego Union Tribune, best Italian or best sous chef or best dishwasher in the restaurant. Like all this fucking (laughs) crap. And they put all these articles all over the thing. We won the best one, which is best Italian restaurant critics choice in San Diego. I don't want it. Keep it. Fuck you. (laughs) That's my answer to the award. Get your award, your Oscar, stick it up your ass. They invited me to the San Diego Best 14th of August. I didn't go. You guys can do it. I don't give a fuck. I don't accept that fucking thing. I don't accept it from people that don't know the basic rec- food critics that don't know the recipe of pasta yeah. and they give me the best Italian restaurant. I'm afraid you might be wrong. Fuck you. I'll judge by myself Fair if enough. I'm the best restaurant. So you're going to get that Michelin star then? Going for it. Right. I don't have enough money right now, but I'm going for it. Yeah. I won't take it this year because I don't have the right investment. I will in the next years. Yes. Dude, I really That's a promise. I really hope you get that Michelin star. That would be yeah, well, fucking G. That's a big promise. This is a promise to all of the food critics in San Diego, to all of the restaurants, to all the people that are like, oh, they want to go for Michelin. I'm not going for Michelin today. I don't have the money. Yeah. Yes, I'm saying to all the jealous Italian restaurant owners that I know they're jealous as fuck. I'm not <laughs> going for it today just because I don't have the money. I'm not lucky as you. Tomorrow, when I'll get my money, and I'll go for it. I'll get it. There's all right. Nothing. Dude, well, good luck in getting that, my man. Thank you. Tell the people where they can find you right now. 1040 University Avenue, Hillcrest area of San Diego. And uh, my Stoso restaurant my for Stoso restaurant. all y'all. There's and only an M outside the door. No big sign, only yep. a logo. No big logo, no big nope. sign, but it's still a beautiful space. And then where can people find you on Instagram? Because that's where you're most uh, most uh, active. Same stuff, my Stoso. M-A-E-S-T-O-S-O, my Stoso. M A E S T O S O. Yeah, there you go. All right, man. Dude, well, go in there. Go see my man because he's always kicking up a storm. And uh, I have to say, Marco, thank you so much for uh, coming for on the show. Dude, this was fun, man. Talking shit. You, you did yeah. the first call outs on my show ever. <laughs> nice. So I hope these people hear it because that yeah, shit is hilarious. Cool. I want to get sued. It's like, you know, right next to me, I have my lawyer. So fuck you all. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> He's been sitting here. He's been kicking it. My man, Luigi, shout out. Um, and yeah, man, thank you again. Marco, right, give me thank some. Thank you. Boom. It was fun as always. Peace. Peace.